right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are we doing today? Great. Great. Awesome. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody out of their days to join in. And really, I want to thank our distinguished guest here and even William, who, who had to join in to, as all family men that we are, help drive his son back to college. And so he'll be joining us via Zoom. So we appreciate you taking the time out. Be safe while you're on the road, but we can't wait to get some valuable insight from you as well. Thanks so much. Um, so today we're doing one of our top agent panels. And with this top agent panel, I wanted to make sure that we were putting together groups of agents who have so many different things to offer, right? And also I wanted an agent that was diverse in this panel, diverse, not just in their own stature, but inside of their business, how they started, where they grew their business and where their business is today. So the establishment we have here, we know that I love to give long drawn out intros about each and every person. And I would be here for 30 minutes talking about each one of you alone, but I want to give you each a chance to go ahead and introduce yourself. So, um, and you, we'll start with you. Um, please tell us who you are. Go with ladies first, always. I, I was, but no, we, we skip right over there. Um, please tell us about you, your business, the size of it, and how many people that you have on your team currently. Um, I'm India Whitlock. I am the owner and team leader of the Madison Mason Home Group. I've been in the industry for since 2005. Um, I have a team of six. It's four agents, two part-time agents, two full-time, one admin, and one transaction. Um, this year, we'll do about $20 million in 62 units. Wow. About yep. you, your business, how the volume that you're doing right now? Yep, sure. So I got in the business in 2014. Uh, we have 12 sales agents, four admin staff, virtual assistant, and uh, this year we're targeting 350 sales at about 100 million. Wow. It's James. Are you sure you don't need to? Look? No, I'm good. All right. Good. All right. About yourself, your business. Uh, Gene Drew, team leader of Gene Drew Property Group. Uh, we have four agents, uh, one transaction coordinator, and an ops manager. Uh, we're on track to do about 100 units this year for a little bit over 20 million. Uh, that's, that's that was it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. William Savage, are you frozen? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please can tell you us about your business and the size. Right. All right, so my name is William Savage. I've been in real estate since about 1995. I um, have about 18 agents on the team. Majority of them are part-time agents. Um, we're on track to do about 125 to 130, and it should top out around 25 million or more. So I have a question for, for each of you. Um, and, and William, we'll start with you. You said you've been in business since 1995. Um, tell us about your start. What was your original goals and, and, and what was your vision when you jumped into real estate? Um, well, when I jumped in, I was act, I actually jumped in helping a buddy out. Um, he was like, hey, I'm going to law school, get my license and I want to open up a real estate firm and I need your help. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, let me pay for you to go to real estate school. Um, and he paid for me to go to real estate school. And my goal was really just to sell one house a month because I had a full-time job. And the first year I sold 11 houses. And then he said, well, look, hey, I want you to start managing my office and I'll pay for you to go to broker's class. He wrote a letter to the board. They accepted me in broker's class and it's been downhill since then. Downhill, downhill, or uphill? Yeah, you're right. That's your ass. Right, right. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a phenomenal start to just jump in and really just have a goal of doing one deal a year to building up a business that's going to be, you said 18 employees and doing what, 125 to 130 and being roughly at 20 million. I think that's a phenomenal transition, which we'll get into and we'll ask some more questions about. Um, Pip, I remember you walking through the building day one. 
how did you start real estate? <clears throat> uh, 2014, um, decided that I was interested in the investment side of the business, wanted to get into flipping homes and, and uh, that space. Um, <clears throat> found out that it wasn't the route that I probably needed to go into because I just had the capital or resources to do so. Uh, decided the sales part, and um, there wasn't uh, many agents that I knew that were in the business back at the time, you know, at the time, and gave it a shot. Just started uh, marketing towards my sphere, uh, asking my parent, my mother, my brother, who in your space do you know that, you know, I can reach out to, kind of started putting my database, and then, yeah, I mean, 2015, that was my first uh, deal in the business. When you first started... Were you a full-time agent or were you part-time? Part-time. So I was part-time up until 2017. Uh, joined KW at the end of 2016, went full-time in June of 2017. And I hired my first assistant at the end of 2017. So 2015, we're a part-time agent. And how many agencies do you have in your team today? We have 12. And how much volume did you plan on doing by the end of the year? Probably 105. Man. A hell of a growth, and we definitely want to talk about your growth and your path to go from dual career to now running a huge, enormous team that's doing phenomenal within their business. Sure. Um, and for you, your path into real estate, how did you get started? Oh, gosh, I uh, 2005, I always knew that I kind of wanted to own rental properties. My grandmother, um, she used to buy properties a lot, and that's kind of where I got the whole. You know, I embody, hey, you need to have real estate because I would see her own rental property. So from there, 2005, I met Angelo Cooper. I was doing a lot of like tenant placement for some nonprofits. And Angelo told me, he was like, you need to get your real estate license because you know more than some agents. So I'm like, no, I just don't want to have to listen to anybody. Let me just do my thing. So I went, um, got my license, um, got licensed while I was pregnant with my son. And I'm here today. And no. I know the, the path that you went through, it, it speaks to the nature of your team, what you've built and everyone who's there. And I can't wait to ask a few questions about that and the makeup of that team based on your start as well. Okay. Gene, for you, your start seems to be a little bit different than others. How did you get it on the real estate side? So I started in real estate, but on the lending side in 2002. Uh, and I was a lender for over a decade. Uh, in 20, I believe, 15. Throughout my career, I flipped homes here and there, just a hobby. And in 2015, uh, I started doing high-end flips. Um, and I just really didn't like the service that my agent gave me. <laughs> when I was doing my flip, that flip was, you know, 750000 in Annapolis. And just the service I received wasn't too thrilled about it. And I thought to myself that I I can do that. So I went and got licensed over Christmas holiday. It was like a week course at a full blown bank office. I took my test. And back then, Vlad was here on, and I joined up because he was here. And the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we've done a lot to grow from day one having a bad experience, being part-time, being a pregnant, just jumping in, and then also helping a buddy out. As your business has grown to the success that you have today, and India, I'll start with you. What has been one of the biggest challenges that you've faced and that you've overcome within this industry? Oh, the biggest challenge for, for me is, um, well, being an individual agent and just kind of, um, you know, not really a big challenge. It's just, you know, I always say this. It's like you, like when you look at Steve, he has twelve agents, and he's going to do a hundred million. And then I have six agents. We're going to do twenty million. The scales are different, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's, it's it's obvious. Maybe his price point is a little higher because, in some capacity, there's some more level of influence in his community and his geographical location and his life and his world. People on his bench. And then you look at, we're going to do 20 million and it's six of us and our average price point is 285. Like the scales aren't, but the biggest challenge is, you know, getting, educating the people with inside your community and your network about home ownership and getting them to them higher price points 
and, and, then, and, and the challenges, like, especially for a lot of African American communities and Asians and things of that nature, our price points are lower because we don't have that level of education as that you would probably see in the Drew world or, you know, some clients in my in, in your world for the most part. Um, so the biggest challenge is, is really educating our people up. Mm -hmm. um, and minority doesn't always have to mean a color. It can be a community as well. You know, and we see that in certain urban communities. We see that we have to educate our people up to a level where we can, as agents and with service in those areas, get those higher price points and capture those bigger sales volumes, volumes and add units and stuff like that. So when we see like a unit that's a team that's doing six, have six people, they can do a hundred million. It's because we kind of nurture those communities at that same price point, but more on a quantitative level. Um, so I think the biggest challenge is really um, getting out there and educating and kind of leveling up um, based off of your, your life experience, based off your community experience, and just just based off of the general world experience, I kind of guess for your geographic field. And then the next challenge is um, really getting in the rooms that people want to show you how to build a team and really deciding, uh, is your life going to go from P to E or E to P? So you want to be an entrepreneur, just gouging people to make money, or you want to be purposeful about it, educating, climbing ladders, bringing people with you, and then everything else will circle back to its to where it needs to be in your business. So the biggest challenge is, you know, finding your your people in your world that you can educate on, and also finding those those uh, that those leverage people that can really help you get to those higher price points. And really um, kind of circumvent things so your, your your pipeline and your bench can look like it needs a bit to go grow to grow your business. The education piece that you spoke about is so pivotal, mm -hmm. right? And I love that you're going out to educate your communities to help develop and grow a bench mm -hmm. that can be there. Um, for you to get that, I know there's a level of education and knowledge that you went through that you've experienced to gain that knowledge and that perspective. To see more um and, and i want to kind of zone in on the education aspect of what you all have learned through this business to help build what you have today um jane specifically I'll, I'll ask you this um i think you are very strategic in what you do to grow what have you learned in this business that has helped your level of growth thus far good talent is hard to come by um so if you have good talent or people who step up to the plate and work. You have to make sure that they're happy, um, enjoy coming into work. Um, the only reason I grew as quick as I did is I got lucky with the first hire and my second hire. And pretty much all my hires that I've had have been lucky. And sometimes I look back and I and think like how much different I could have went if like, for example, my operations manager, Alyssa, who started as a transaction coordinator, if I, she's been with me for over a year, if first six months I trained, tr we trained each other and learned how to work together, then I had to start all over again. I mean, my business wouldn't have been able to grow this way. Mm -hmm. So getting good talent, both on the admin side and on the agent side, I think it was good for me. Well, and let me ask this question, and I know Mark will, will have some things to go through because I think he's built his business by hiring great people as well. Um, tell me about your first hire, and Pip, we'll start with you. Who was the first hire that you had growing your business, and how did that work out? Um, my first hire was a bad hire. <laughs> uh, I didn't recognize it at first. Uh, I, I kind of saw some red flags early on, and I kind of just uh, didn't pay attention to them. Right. So uh, my first hire was my admin. Right. So not having a cell phone is probably not a good thing, right? In this space, in this world. So me having to buy our cell phone was probably a red flag. She was very smart. <laughs> and I tend to like like something about somebody when I meet them and I want to see the good in them. Right. So uh, I thought that I could uh, cultivate her and, and uh, you know mold her into what I want. And I did. And she spoke the way I spoke. She wrote emails the way I wrote emails, but uh, there was some red flags there. Uh, didn't follow the process, didn't uh, she took a KPA, but didn't follow the CV process, which we now do uh, pretty much to a T. Um, so that was probably my biggest mistake, I'm gonna say biggest mistake in my business, but that was a significant learning point mm -hmm. uh, that I need to follow the process because I did keep her from 2017 until 2020, um, almost because I had, I, I cared about her, but also 
I didn't have anybody else to compare it to or, or anybody else that could step up and realize like, okay, this is what I'm missing. So, yeah. So you mentioned CV being a process, right? And that helping you. Um, and, and William, you've been in since 95, had a team. Um, what are some of the strategies that you went through from your first hire, which, you know, we laugh at being a bad hire to being able to grow and cultivate a team as large as yours right now. What are some of the strategies that you go through that you use? Um, well, I think the first thing, um, when you, when you do a hire, you have to understand people. Um, you have to hire somebody that doesn't want to count your money because the person that you hire you have to understand that they're going to see your transactions, understand your transactions, count your money. And the first thing they're going to want is a raise. That's the first thing. So you, uh, my challenge is people, and I'm a piggyback on India, is educating people and getting them to uh, understand the products that you have out there for them and how they can benefit and build their own legacy. And with that said, that's when I began to strategize and put on home buying workshops, a bunch of mini workshops to kind of educate people as to what their options are and what home ownerships look like. Education again being key. I think that, that's strong and valuable. Um, and you mentioned this a little bit, and, and I really want to ask you as a panel, from the education aspects, I know William puts on home buying seminars, I see you completely engaged with your clientele, providing different education opportunities. Jay, we go way back, so I know what you do to involve and educate your clients. Talk about how that education builds a database for you as a lead generation strategy as you go forward. Oh, so um, for us, like we are, so for us, uh, the way I approach uh, the team is like we do a lot of client events and through the client events, whether it's a hard hit or a soft hit, we collect the data because the DNA data is dollars, right? So the data is so important in, in order for you to really nurture your business, especially if you don't want to buy leads. And we don't buy leads. We'll be do, we'll do 20 million. We didn't buy any leads. Everything is self-generated from nurturing business over time. Say it again. You're doing 20 million this year, and how much are you spending on leads? Zero. Okay. So the nurturing, tell me about the nurturing. What are you doing to nurture your clients? So I believe like when you have access to certain rooms and certain people and certain, certain opportunities, if you can't take your people with you, you go there and you take the information and bring it back to your people. So when you when I post things on Facebook, I invite everybody to our client event because from that I'll grab the data and that's free data and they came to my event and they get to know me more because it you know they see that she's re either relatable or not relatable. I want to be in business with her or I'm just going to send referrals her way. However you want to do it, or a lost leader approach to that is hey I can help in the community events which they will bring five other people and maybe you won't help us. Um, you know, generate new business, but your friends will. Mm -hmm. So it's just like everything for us is capturing the data through community events very organically, and that turns into dollars through, for us because we nurtured a relationship, not just something that came off the street out of the sky through whatever lead generation source, like, you know, the ones that you pay for, or whatever you're paying for. We just, we, we, we do that, and I, I just believe in that because in speaking with people during COVID, like when I get into those rooms, I take those notes because they never said the notes. The notes cost me, but they're free to you, right? So I'm going to give you information that I set five hours to get. You're going to get that in five seconds. How dope is that, right? So I write down every note and I post it online and I send it out to if anybody is interested in getting more of my notes because you don't want to get the ticket away. got to earn the ticket. Then I, I had the data from them sending, hey, been sending an email to hello at madisonmasonhomegroup.com because then hey it's you got my data and i got a new lead that either you can come to a community event i can tell you what's going on in the market or you can be a buyer seller or a friend so how are you and, and we're going to break that down it's very interesting how are you capturing that data so we're putting on a client event what's the next event that you're doing 
So the next event that we're doing is going to be a fall barbecue. And it's going to be at the Peabody Brewery in the city. And um, sometimes we like to engage like um, public leaders to come or um, whoever that kind of can get people in their world to come. Because when they sign up on our sign up link, they become our clients or our friends or our customers. So then we have data and we decide, hey, do we want to invite this particular person to the event? Or they still go to our drip campaign, which everybody gets, but we kind of can sort through the data that's new clients as well as old clients. So we may lean on a community person or maybe someone who we have some interest in or just go into that community who we, we know in, don't know anything about because we're in the barbecue community and there's an average price point there. There are middle class, upper middle class people there and it's a community restaurant. So it's a walkable community so they can walk and we don't turn people down. We let you in and we get your data and then they know who we are as a, as a real estate team in their community or what we could possibly be in their community for them. It's phenomenal. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, tip for your business. What are you doing for the agents that are there? What are, what are some of the lead generation strategies that you've been most successful with thus far? Um, so we're, we're very heavy in sphere. Uh, our business is 84% sphere based. So we're very relationship driven. Um, sending out pieces of education material, whether it's quarterly, um, giving them calls, giving updates in the market happening right so uh it's changing it seems like now every every few months it's changing uh, buyers and seller side it's, it's everything's uh, dynamic so um just updating people uh where things are inventory wise rate wise in their specific community locally uh, looking right so people want to know what's happening uh so they can i guess prepare for their future and uh, what that looks like um, and I think you sell yourself short on some of the things that you do as well, which any kind of talk about. I feel as if you're almost an innovator or influencer with some of the social media aspects and things that you do where it almost feels as if you're missing out if you're not a part of some of the things that you have going on or with your clients as well. So yeah. don't sell yourself short on that because I think that's yeah. phenomenal. So what you I think for me, it's a bit of FOMO, right? So like anytime I'm invited to something, I want to go to it. Right, whether it's a mastermind, whether it's a, a friend of mine having some sort of get together, uh, these are all people that I can get in front of and, and work with, and it's all organic, right? Whenever I go there, it's never a recruiting opportunity or me talking to them, trying to recruit them. It's all passive, so it's all building relationships, um, and that's going to then turn into something later on, right? So, uh, just the more people you surround yourself with, and, and being in bigger rooms as well, I mean, and being invited to. To events and masterminds where you're uh, just not exposed to that often uh, people that are typically not in your sphere um, it's beneficial yeah um and digging a little bit deeper in the sphere-based business that you have so as you built that out what have been some tools that you right and then the systems that you put in place to help you capture that data from your sphere mm -hmm. to know that this is going to be a prime client to talk to in the next six to eight months yeah so it's all tracking right so it's it's not just uh so when you have an initial contact using some sort of a database and they say the best CRM is the one you're going to use uh so putting some sort of reminder for yourself following back up and, and not only following up with that person just following through um so whether you're talking to them monthly, quarterly, annually, based on what their financial position looks like and their motivation, just uh, just continue to be front of mind. Um, and you know, sometimes it's it's about you know the way I kind of social media presence wise about bringing our clients, celebrating their wins, and, and that's then going to turn into people recognizing that you're you know, reminding them that you're in the space, uh, you're helping somebody that they probably have a mutual friend of. Baltimore is too small, right? And we probably all have mutual friends that have four or five realtor friends, right? So just if they, and trust is the number one thing. If they can trust you, they're going to continue to come back to you and uh, won't get any questions asked when you give them guidance as far as what you believe is the next best thing for them. Absolutely. So, and William, that's a great transition into you. Trust is something that we've earned. You've been in business for almost 30 years now and been a go-to realtor, go-to go source for business. 
what has been something that's been a key metric for your business that you've used to be so consistent throughout the time that you've been in real estate? Um, people, be people believe in you. Um, and I, I do a lot. Um, I feel like I do a lot in the community and my network of people um, drives my business just from what I do, who I surround myself around, and you know, the kind of the company that I keep. And a lot of times people feel like that I have a wealth of knowledge and people want that knowledge. So that, that knowledge that you have, you've been able to grow and cultivate agents day in and day out. They've been on your team, they've been a part of it. Um, what has been key as far as, and, and we'll stick to the Legion conversation that we're having right now. Um, through almost 30 years, you driving new leads, having business, being consistent, always being no less than 10 million for really the last 15 years. Um, what has been that key driver? What, what's the key metric that you use from a lead generation or a database source that you're going through to continually to one, have business that keeps you, you know, between 15 to 20 million each year, but then two, see a level of growth each year as you go forward. What are you using from a lead generation of the business source to get there? Um, well, we, we just started in the last couple of years uh, using, using Zillow. Um, however, I, I have a nonprofit and I have, uh, the nonprofit is a football program. I have about 225 kids within that football program, each and every one of those kids, I, I make sure that I let their parents know that I do real estate uh, and that drives the business. Um, I also coach high school football and the high school coaches and kids that I engage. And when I talk to their parents, I let them know that I do real estate. And if they you know, have to move or need to move or want to purchase, um, so that drives the business. From the home buy seminars and workshops, just because you can't buy a house now doesn't mean that you're out of the equation. So what we do is we cultivate the people and we put them in a drip campaign or we send them to a credit repair person so that in the future that they're able to purchase a house. So that future business is always going to be there because you're going to have some those that you have that are right now. I think your follow-up that you have to be able to do that and be able to have such a wide bench that you develop is phenomenal. And I think that's what also helps you establish and keep agents on your team fed with different leads as they go forward. I think that's a, a phenomenal viewpoint in the way that you go about business. Um, Gene, I'm gonna come to you and I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to stay in the same back. Um, since you've been at KW, I, I know that you've really honed in on some of the systems and the tools that we use, right? To make sure that you're developing your business. What has been some of the key strategies that you've learned since you've been in KW that's gotten you to your point right now? 100% everybody has to be the KPA for them to get hired. That's crucial uh, to me. Every, when I look back on my KPAs, sometimes the results don't, you still end up, you still end up giving, you know, a chance to an agent where the results from the KPA probably at this stage in my game, I probably wouldn't give that same agent a chance to work on the team. And like Steve, like you get the benefit of the doubt or you like their personality. And I've chalked it up to them. Oh, they didn't pay attention while they were taking the KPA. I know they can do better than this. When the reality is like, you know, they can't, if they were going to show up for the KPA, they're not going to show up for your work. So it really doesn't matter. So using the tools that KW has, I mean, they're there for a reason. I haven't ever heard an agent say that a tool doesn't work that is within KW. So I embraced all the tools that KW you know, has to offer uh, with the KPA being my you know, go to because I'm doing all the hiring. Firing. <laughs> um, you said something that's interesting. Um, one of the, the tools always work, but if they don't show up in this vector, how can I expect them to show up in another? I know a large part of your business is 
fact that you were present, you were there, you show up, and you make sure that your agents show up. Talk to me a bit about that and how that has established Gene Drew as a name. Um, I mean, leading by example is really big uh, for me. Uh, we do have lead gen, uh, group lead gen several times a week. Um, and a lot of people get surprised when I say I, I'm there with them making calls. Um, I see managers look down upon and being back in that sales world. Um, but ultimately we're here because of our, you know, our sales skills. Um, so I lead by example, I hope I'll show up and the business just falls in your lap, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems as if it falls in our lap, but you're very purposeful. You're very calculated with the things that you do. So just from a, a lead generation standpoint with the team, you say you lead gen every morning with them? Uh, we so all agents lead gen every day as a group. We're lead gen twice a week, um, and then we also do other lead gen activities. So, for example, this evening we're doing door knocking from five to seven around a, a around a listing as a team. Hmm. Um, so that doesn't happen every week. Um, we're tr trying to you know make better habits of it, but we definitely do. Um, very thankful and glad to hear we do a lot of what these guys said, which makes me feel good because it's rare we get to hear what other teams do. Um, what everybody said, I mean, we virtually do some variation or capacity of what they do. Um, and, and then lead gen as a team, we, by example, so I'm always there and we got door knocking tonight. So the leadership aspect is key, lead by example. And with everybody who's on this panel, one thing I can see inside of each of your business, you all lead by example. Um, why is that so important for your business? And then we'll start with you. In this business, there's no secret sauce, right? There's no, there's not one thing that where I'm gonna hide what I do as a business that I'm not gonna tell Gene because I wanna get as much business as I can. It's all hard work too. It's all work ethic. It's all showing up in the end of the day, right? So, um, I want everybody on my team to run as fast as I can, right? I don't want somebody who's gonna, you know, work half-ass and, and, and not want as much as I do, right? They're just not somebody that would want uh, to maybe push me, right? Because in my business, it's not all about me, it's, it's all about we. Um, and I want somebody who's gonna push me to get there as, as, uh, as much as everybody else, you know, as an agent on my team that, that's part-time and does, you know, 14 million. Uh, and he always looks at me, my numbers, and like, damn, Pip, like, how come I never can reach him? Like, I don't want you to reach me. I want you to, like, continue to try and push yourself to get there, uh, which I hope that he does one day, and sure he will, you know, and surpass me. But um, it, it's hard work, man. It's, it's all showing up, being there for people, you know, when somebody has a question, not sounding like you just had, like, a you know, horrible call of a seller, you know, just slowing down, hearing what they're, they're asking, and being there for them. So just being present and looking out for them and people care and they'll, they can tell when you care. They can. Absolutely. Absolutely. And India, uh, you mentioned earlier and I said how you started in this industry and where you are now and that dynamic of how it's built your team and who you hire to the team and what they go through. I think it's phenomenal. Um, can you talk a bit about how your path allows you to be a leader within your team, but then also what that attracts to your business as well? I think for me are the relationships that I've built, um, which gives um, access to different opportunities for us to grow. Um, I think every um, every leader on a team should have some coach or something that can take that information to their team members. Like Steve said, I don't believe any nobody works for me. Everybody, we all work together. We work with each other. I don't care what vertical um, of my business entity I'm in, we all work together and we have a good time when we do it. And like Steve said, like, you know, I want to teach my people on the team to be me in different clothing because I'm always running. I'm always running. And you can't catch me because I want you to work as hard to catch up to whatever your dreams are. But um, we just, we support each other. And that's what, I mean, Tr Trina's here, the leaders on the, um, then we definitely support each other. And that's what you need as a leader because it's, Leaders, we don't have all the answers. You know, we don't. We Say don't. And sometimes we start, we show up on calls and we're like, what are we going to talk about today? You know, we didn't talk about everything. 
but we just ask like, how are you feeling? How are you doing it today? What can I do to support you? And, and sometimes having those conversations outside of the team calls to say, hey, what do you need? And then we talk about our fears. We talk about things that make us, you know, we, I say, hey, am I not a good leader today? Tell me, because that's the only way we're gonna grow if, you're, if we're honest with each other. Um, and then what can we do to support each other to, to make all of us stronger people with inside of our organization? So, you know, they can grow their, because they're a business inside of a business. And you want them to be those business owners inside of your business, inside of your vision, inside of your core values. And I think whoever you bring on from a leadership standpoint, they need to embody your core values and core vision and all of that. Because if you don't know your vision for your team or your mission, then it's like you, who, who's on your bench? Who, they all confused. So I think that's important that people on my team know like we're community based. And that's kind of how we grow and nurture our business and our leads and our sphere. We're going to touch base on the community aspect because each of you have some great things you do in the community. But you mentioned your development as a leader and, and the coaching that you get. Um, Gina, I'll, I'll ask you, um, how have you utilized coaching and really the, the sphere and, and different educational aspects in your own development to be able to pass through your team? Um, so I've been in the mortgage business since 2002, and I have a pretty leader base, I would say, both from people in the industry, um, and agents, loan officers, insurance agents, and a lot of people have, who have been in one aspect or another in multiple industries. Um, so I definitely do a lot of brain picking. Um, I don't have a coach, which is actually on my to-do list. Well, I mean, I do, well, I do, I do, I, well, we do meet with Brandon and uh, Zach uh, monthly, which, probably need more coaching than that. Um, and um, just, I, I pick, I mean, I call Steve. <laughs> I, I call, I mean, I call every call India. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I call Steve, I, I call my past and present uh, team leaders um, within the market center. I mean, I've called them as brand and stuff. I call uh, Teal Kleiss, who used to be my team leader all the time. Um, so I, I definitely pick people's brains, um, listen to masterminds, um, and try to do the best that, that I can with the information um, and disseminate it to my team. But uh, it, it, there's not a silver bullet. There's not one person. It's a lot of different people and then hearing a lot of different things and using it using it basically now, however you're going to use it just as long as you're using it um you know it lead gen in the morning some people say oh i'm not a morning person all right we'll do it in the evening or well, the crm is slow i'm like all right well, what crm are you using so regardless of where you are um as long as you're using the tools i think and i also think from a leadership standpoint we have to decide like far as training and coaching and stuff for our transitional people and who are, because you have transformational coaches. And then you also have those coaches that can really show you in detail all the economics in your business and things that you, how to structure it on a, on a model. Mm -hmm. So when I say transitional coaches, those are the people who are going to give you the ideas. Those are the ones that are going to give you the vision. But then you have those, um, those operational coaches who are going to be your integrators, who are going to help you integrate, um, taking that vision and integrating it into a system. So when you're having those conversations, I might reach out to Steve for a, you know, maybe a more integrative type of conversation. What do you think? And he might reach out to me for a more visionary conversation. Like, how can I build this or create this, this event at a higher level that will get more people so I can integrate the data that I'm using at a real high level. So I think as leaders, we have to be real clear on our coaches because some leaders have two coaches, transformational, meaning get them off of their soapbox and motivate them. And they have those integrators like Mark can tell you about P&Ls and break down the numbers and all of that other stuff. So you need two arms here because you, you just can't do it all by yourself. So I think rather on, in, the teams, in the team model, there should be a transformational coach, a visionary, and there should also be like 
big operational person like a mark that can say hey these are the people you need to stop spending this money, Steve, at the golf course. You know, <laughs> did you hire for? No, no, no. Did you hire for Are leverage you or did you? Did, right? I did you hire for leverage or did you hire for luxury? You know, and that's what you know that those two coaches need to do for you as a team when you build your team, or if you're not going to build a team, if you're an individual person, however you want to build it out, you need to. Own. So, it's actually phenomenal statement that you made, and, and Gina. I want to pick on you for a little bit, right? Um, I'm individual. Okay. I want to go forward. You mentioned something great that really from a coaching aspect and from education, you pick out of your sphere. People who've done different things in their business and you have that conversation. What does it look like when you make that phone call out to someone and you're, you're looking for information? How does that conversation go? How do you start? Just ask. Just ask for it. I mean, I... So a lot, so believe it or not, a lot of the time the information is offered up to you uh, because they know why you're calling. Just like if you're making similar calls, they want you to succeed. So just the conversation, where the conversation goes, like organically, like falls there. At least the people I end up calling, which is because you can see when somebody's really helpful, when somebody cares, when somebody shows up. So you end up reaching out to those people. So I can assure you if I'm calling somebody a third, fourth, fifth time in the last year, they probably already know why I'm calling. I don't need to sugarcoat it. I'm like, hey, what's up? All right, what's your issue today, Gene? I mean, they, well, it's the same thing with your, when you're calling for lead gen, if you're calling my sphere, and you agents always ask, they're like, Gene, well, how do you ask for the business? Like, you know what? I do, but people know why I'm calling. Like I'm calling during the day. It's the fifth time I called them over the last few years. Yes, we have conversation about how they're doing, but ultimately they know that before they end the conversation, I'm going to ask them what's up, who's buying, who's selling, who do they know? So it, it just organically, I feel like falls into that. Mm. It's true. And, and William, I, I know that we've had conversations and you've been on the opposite end. You've received that phone call from many different agents throughout the past really 20 years. So being on that side of an agent calling, reaching out and asking questions of, hey, I'm struggling with this in my business. How do you take that? Is that something that you encourage? Are you engaging with that? And is that something that helps you on your development path as well? I think, I think it's something that helps me because when it comes down to coaching, I think everybody should, should be coaching and should be coachable. Um, and, and when it comes down to coaching, even if you're, even if you feel like you know more than that person in front of you, everybody can teach you something and you have to have that open mind. And that's, you know, how I attract people to either join Keller Williams um, or even join my team because they'll call with the question. They'll call, you'll help them out. You'll ask them like, hey, how's, how's that business going? Sometimes people even want to take it to the next level and say, hey, can I just call you just for like some weekly consultation as to growing my business? And if you have that open mind and become coachable as well as coaching somebody, then you'll see that, you know, doors will open and the business will, you know, grow unconsciously. So you're as giving as you are receiving, but willing to jump out there. And this, and I want to transition just a, a tad bit into really what we do for our communities. And William, we'll stick with you. Um, the success that you've built in real estate, how have you transitioned that to become a leader within your community as well? Uh, sometimes I think I'm a leader in the community. Um, but I mean, I'm out in the community every single day. I mean, I have a nonprofit. I do volunteer work. Um, I have a gym that's totally dedicated to, to use um, and, you know, their, you know, growth. Um, I volunteer my time with, as far as education um, inside of the school. Um, you and I, we uh, did dumpsters at, you know, uh, community events. Um, you know, we, we throw our holiday party, uh, we do, you know, movie night where we run out the whole, you know, movie theater and, you know, it's just a matter 
of giving back. And that's just our way of giving back is through, you know, the community and community events. And Pip, I'll, I'll ask the same question for you. How have you established yourself as a leader within your community and giving back to the communities in which you serve? Yeah, so a few of our agents are all uh, either active or former first responders. So we've uh, found ways to kind of tie ourselves into that, um, support them, which is you know what we should do as a community, plus also it's supporting our agents and their business in some way. Um, charity events, uh, bigger uh, words, um, participate in events, uh, whether it's a sponsor, uh, being active in it, right? I mean, you know, guys with my to play around in golf and, and do it towards a charity, but I'll do I'll do so if you ask me. Uh, so anything that we can kind of just uh, you know, if there's a friend of mine in the business, a is a charity and, and a profit or nonprofit where he uh, youth sports leagues in, in the inner city specifically where they can't afford sports equipment for football, soccer, baseball, um, he will buy them the equipment. And so we're uh, one of his, uh, I would say, bigger sponsors. And similar to what we do, so every transaction we donate to KW Cares, also donate to his uh, foundation as well. So giving back to, to people that we love, uh, that are doing good things, just supporting them, right? So, um, yeah. How is that fulfilling for you in your business? Just seeing somebody else happen, right? Seeing somebody else uh, sometimes get emotional, uh, that that's the biggest thing uh, that you can do for me. Um, just makes me feel like that I'm giving back and, and doing something uh, is, is 100% rewarding. Uh, so, yeah. Definitely. And Gene, what about you? What are you guys doing for your communities that you serve? So, um, I am part of a smaller niche community. Um, so, I, I chair a few events for my temple. Um, I definitely sponsor the events, uh, depending on uh, our temple is all sponsored based, meaning that there's no larger organization that feeds into it. Um, so I help plan actually, uh, I chair one event and then I help with the rest of them. Um, and I actually, within those events have opened up to other people in the community to be able to be a part of the event, being able to get them to sponsor events. Um, so I, 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 that's probably the main nonprofit, my main nonprofit activity that I do. Um, we do a lot of events within the community um, where, as a team, uh, for the less fortunate this year, for the second year, we're going to be making back so we can a handout for the homeless. Um, there's a couple of nonprofits that give lunches on weekends in the parks. So we usually provide um, 60 to 100 bags for the group that they come in on the weekend. Um, and then our agents usually have 10 to a dozen in their car. Um, 60 to 70% of our business is in Baltimore City. So when we're driving, especially on those cold days, and they ask for money or ask for help, we give those bags that have you know, hygiene products, keep something to keep them warm. Um, so just our way of giving back, um, that's more of a selfish thing because it makes me feel better when I do something like that. So I don't know how much business we get out of it, but um, it, it's that we, we definitely want to give back uh, to the community um, regardless of how it's going to affect our business. Well, that's the key of KW. We give back to the communities in which we serve and not necessarily for monetary gain, but because it's rewarding and fulfilling. Yeah. Um, in India, I know that you're involved in a lot. So what are you doing? Um, we always get back. Um, we do, we have this new brown bag project initiative where we go in to communities. We just finished up one where we, um, every agent on the team, they went into their respective communities that they want to nurture and we dropped off brown bags and with instructions. Um, and we also had an Amazon wish list where we want to help women, period, give them all feminine products, um, that they need, um, uh, just to feel whole, um, um, almost whole, you know. So we um, we just pick the um, pick the bags up in the community, drop them off, and then we donated it to a charity. Um, I sit on the board at Family Recovery Center, which helps women who were recently on drugs helps them become reunited with their families or their children. Most importantly, um, we did the House of Roof and the Caris House, which are all shelters in Baltimore. Um, city and they were very grateful and um, 
We also gave a scholarship away to a young man who was going to Columbia University. He was going to be a social worker. And we know social workers, they don't make a lot of money. So we wanted to help him support his education. We sent a, um, we uh, donate to, um, um, I believe in Me Girls, which, which is a mentoring program in Baltimore County for young women. And we're sending five of their young ladies to Spain. I think they think Spain or something. Um, so we just do a lot in the community. We don't really do it to collect the data. We do it because it's what we're supposed to do. Because when we do it, it'll all come back to us in some way. It may be, you know, an, a loss leader approach as far as on the business, on the data side, lead to opportunities and smiles and, and happy places for us. Well, I think it, it makes all of us genuine, mm -hmm. right? We're here, we're serving our communities, we're doing business with them, but we're very genuine in the fact that we give back in the different metrics in which we do it. So I think it's phenomenal that we do that and we definitely should applaud. <laughs> so we're, we're nearing towards the end of the hour, but I do wanna know, you guys have done so much and built yourselves up this far. What's next? And, and William on Zoom, we'll start with you. What's next for William Savage and what's next for the Savage Home Group? Uh, the sky's the limit. Um, I believe uh, I, I want to top out at about 25 agents um, and I just want to continue to build and grow the Savage Home Group brand um, and definitely uh, do more um, in the community, you know, coming up as far as like um, I'm more geared toward the schools uh, because with me coaching, uh, it's just that I see a lot and you know, and talking to the kids, believe it or not, even though the school serves lunch, there's a lot of kids that leave that high school and go home and don't have anything at all to eat. So uh, we're going to dig into that uh, a little bit more and see where we can help and making sure that, you know, all of these kids have a place to go and they have food when they get there. And Gene, what's next for Gene Drew? Um, so my goal is to be a $40 million team. So we have a lot more business to do. Um, not necessarily grow with the amount of agents. Uh, I, I am looking to hire a few agents, um, but I'm not looking to have 25 or a million, <laughs> I can assure you. Uh, but I would love to get my agents capped quicker. Um, and I would like a few more agents to help me hit my goal and double up my business next year. Um, and you? Um, of course, you want to double our business because that's what I've been trained and that's all I know. <laughs> um, um, we also stick collectively tapping into some FRPs and some community lending where um, as women, we can benefit from investing in Baltimore City collectively as a team as investment opportunities. So we're working on that. Um, my side, we're on the development side, the building side, and just to train some people, nurture relationships up so that we can hire more agents who can buy in or relatable to the vision and core values so we can grow a, a massive um, team in Baltimore City and Baltimore County. Specific to you, isn't there something coming up that you're being highlighted for very soon? So next, yeah. next week I'll be speaking in Vegas at the Ending Connect Conference, and we'll be discussing which is which is I you know I was told is a big deal. It and, is absolutely a big deal. Um, we had our prep call last week, so it's going to be about we'll be on the main stage myself and a um, gentleman from California speaking about wealth building on the other side of real estate sales. So it'll be about 4,000 people. We're going to have fun and just maybe give some, be relatable to the people in the audience. What's next for you? Um, so business-wise, we want to we want to grow, right? We're going to double our business if we can. Uh, that's by people, right? Uh, hiring good people, both on the agent side and admin side. We know that we're, we're scaled to grow right now. So growing agents uh, will then allow us to uh, put more money to the company to give more support and to grow that way. 
Um, <clears throat> we are uh, looking to have a lot of the agents grow their passive income through real estate investing. You know, there's we're in the space. We know about uh, investment properties. Uh, I'm always that's that's why I sell real estate is to buy real estate. Uh, so encouraging our agents to do that instead of you know they can put it into cryptocurrency or the 401k or, or the stock market, but there's nothing better to safer in my opinion than the real estate market is what we know and do, right? We know it's a good investment, we see it. So encourage them to do that. Um, and just being aware of where the market's going, you know, there's a lot of things happening and, and changing in the market. So being aware of what's coming in the next 24 months or so, and, and just kind of uh, preparing for that. Nice. Nice. Well, I want to say thank you to all of our esteemed panelists. You guys have been phenomenal as we're wrapping up our hour. Um, I thank you for the insight that you've had. I thank you for what you do for your communities. I thank you for what you do for Halloween Place. Um, just being pillars and leaders inside of your business alone allows all of us to come, be in tune, and really want to hear what you guys have to say. So thank you all for coming. We really, truly appreciate you guys taking your time out to be here and just share a little bit of your knowledge with us. Um, for everyone who's here, as you've seen the business that they've grown and that they've developed, it's important to realize that there are opportunities that are coming up for you to learn and grow as well. So this Thursday, the Market Center, we are hosting the Business Planning Clinic. So we will be teaching in the Market Center from 10 to 3. This is something that you can come sit down, learn, grow, and figure out what you should do for 2022 to help grow your business where you can go from being a dual career agent or from one to help a friend out or from just jumping in because you had bad service. This is how you can develop your business in a way that you can grow to be the next panelist that we have on stage. So without further ado, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate everyone's time today. Definitely.